something that is very important uh, for me and something that I believe is very important in general. Uh, so not only teaching the language, which is what we do, and that's, that's our job, uh, but something that goes beyond teaching the language and something uh, that we teachers have to think about um, to, to help our students and to make them better and more independent learners. So I would like to talk about uh, cognitive skills and cognitive competence. Uh, but let me start with a personal anecdote. Now, does anyone here know any of these languages? Can you speak any of these, apart from Latin, because you can't really speak Latin, right? But you can read Latin. So, okay, who knows German? Okay, I envy you. And French? Okay. Oh, German and French. Okay, Latin, anyone? Okay, that's impressive. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. I did some Latin in high school too. The things that I do not understand. I know some proverbs, everyone knows them. But I do not, I, if, you give me a if you give me a text, I wouldn't be able to understand. And same with German and French. So I spent three years on learning German and three years on learning French and three years on studying Latin. And I know nothing about these languages. And I thought, well, maybe they're just difficult. Maybe, like, I don't know, <clears throat> maybe I'm just not skilled enough. But then, uh, when I was an already an adult, I started to learn another language, which is this. Is there anyone here who knows Armenian? Okay, there's not many people speaking Armenian, but the thing is, I really like the country. I wanted to get to know the culture, so I started to learn it. And I started two years ago, and I think my level now is around eight to ish, let's say. Uh, and just, just to make sure that you know what I mean, this did not freak me out. Like, this did not stop me from learning the language. And it only took me two years to get from A0 nothing to A2. And just to let you know, uh, this language is not similar to anything you might know. Anything. Like, uh, um, what would you like me to say? Okay, what if this is Manu and Margarita? Yes, I'm from Varshava, and we are from Hayer and Lezu, but we have a card from Varshat Gagetika. So this is like, my name is Gosia, and I live in Warsaw. I'm learning the language because I think it's beautiful. So uh, I can talk. I can talk. And I sometimes hitchhike in Armenia, and I can talk to people. Most of the time, we have the same small talk in every car, so it's a bit annoying sometimes. But I know these dialogues by heart. It's proper drilling. Um, but I started to think, like, how come this language is so easy for me, and I learn so quickly? And these languages were a nightmare. I love them. I love the sound of them, but I just couldn't. And uh, I figured out that to me, when I was learning language, or these languages at school, to me, most of the time, it was learning you know, adjectives, nouns, grammatical structures, and so on. And Armenian was slightly different, because I had to use it to travel, to the, I mean, when I was in the country, to, to communicate with people, and to learn about their culture. I'm really interested in the culture of the region, so I wanted to find out. No one speaks English. There are places in the world where no one speaks English. I was surprised, uh, but that's true. Uh, so, so I had no choice, and so on one hand I had no choice, on the other I was really interested. And sometimes I also needed the language to survive, because otherwise, like, you know, everything is written in Armenian. You don't know where you're going, but you need to get somewhere. You ask, but no one knows what to say because they don't speak English. So this was a tool that I needed to find my way in a country that I fell in love with. And uh, so I was thinking, like, so, so how come, again, how come I managed to learn the language? And I... I uh, came to the conclusion that I applied some cognitive skills that I've gained throughout my learning process, and that's why it was way easier for me. So when I was another person already, I knew how to learn a language, and I knew why I'm learning the language for. I needed it not to understand nouns, verbs. This was important. This is still important. I'm still A2. But I needed it to, to use it. And I started to use it after the first month. I couldn't say much, just hello, how are you? But, uh, but it was useful. People started to react in a very positive way and it was easier to hitchhike. So I was never stuck on the side of a road for three hours anymore. So today in this session, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about four things that I believe uh, are very important when we teach the language, apart from teaching the language. So, how to support our students, our young learners, with learning new vocabulary, with finding key information in a text or any, any source of information, how to analyze what they see and what they come across, and finally, how to express their opinion in a foreign 
language, which in this case is English. So let's start with learning new vocabulary, and I have a task for you. So here, there are three words in Armenian. Okay, they're written in Latin alphabet, so it's a bit easier. So we have a pencil, which is matit. Would you repeat? Okay, then a ruler, which is kanon. And a pen, which is gurich. All right, so I'm going to give you two minutes to learn these words. Now, you can use any methods you want. You can write them down, you can try to drill them in your head, whatever, whatever works for you. Okay, but just two minutes. Okay, so you're looking at me, so you probably already remember them. Uh, let's check. So, what's this? Canon, all right. And this? Uh huh. Matit or Matisse? Matit, okay. And this? <laughs> okay. Good each. Okay, you're very, very <laughs> good learners. Uh, you're way better than me. You should try Armenian. You're going to be B2. Like, you know, by now you'd have been B2. Okay, so um, what methods did you use to learn these three words? They're not similar to anything, you know, so you, you had to apply some, some skills. So is there anyone who tried writing them down? Yeah? Okay. Two people. Okay. And anyone trying to, like, you know, drill them in your head, like, gurich, 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 gurich. Anyone? Okay. Do you still remember this one? Okay, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, uh, anyone who tried maybe uh, writing the word and co you cover it with your hand and then you kind of slowly uncover it and try to recall? Anyone did that? Okay, that's also an option. Uh, anyone made a picture maybe? Okay, so have writing pictures. Okay, excellent. Uh, what type of a picture, by the way? Something more like this, so you draw a picture and put a word inside, or you make this item a part of the word? Or just, ah, oh, separately. Okay, so something more like a dictionary. Okay, now, um, this is the way that I learn, and these are the methods that I use when I learn. And I really wish someone had told me when I was a kid that this is an option. Because what I did when I was a, stu when I was a, a child and then a teenager, I would just you know, make word lists and then try to memorize them. And, you know, and then the test comes and then you write it, you get five and you forget and it's over. And then you're somewhere at the airport and you don't know how to buy a bottle of water because you forgot, right? So I wish someone had told me that uh, I can draw pictures. I never did it as a kid. Seriously, I'm not joking now. And uh, I wish someone told me that I can try to drill these words, like, you know, write it down, cover, and then slowly uncover. Uh, or maybe one of my favorite methods, grouping words. So I learn new words, and then when I learn new words, I find a proper group for them. So I have a categorized them, right? They're put in categories, so then when I need a word, I can easily recall it because I know which group it belongs to. So, for example, the objects you can find in your room, right? Um, and speaking about pictionaries, I always thought that pictionaries are for children, and I love them with children. I was just to let you know, I still use them, and I still make pictionaries, and uh, they work for me, and they work for my students too. We love it. We, we do it all, um, all the time. So, these are some basic skills that you can use, they can develop in your students, but I believe that a very important thing is that uh, is to to add more skills as a course goes by, right? So uh, we start with drawing. At first, we have six-year-olds. They they don't really write. I mean, they're learning, right? But it's kind of not there yet. They're getting there. So uh, we start with writing very short words, copying words, or sometimes you have these dotted lines and you just follow the pattern. And uh, then with uh, second graders. You can, you know, they already know the alphabet, they already know how to write, so they can put the words in alphabetical order within their categories. So it's easier to find a word because at some point you get a lot of words. 
And uh, finally, uh, the third grade, something that I find very interesting. Are you familiar with CCQs? Concept checking questions. So you ask, you have a word and you ask questions and you check if you can answer them. And that's how you check if you really understand the word, okay? So for example, uh, let's take the word cow, right? Is cow black and white? Yeah, cow is black and white. Uh, does it go woof woof? No. Does it go moo? All right. So I get the concept of the word, right? I know that cow is black and white. It goes moo. Um, you know, cow is a noun, so it's less of a challenge. But then, at some point, we learn some adjectives. We learn to describe feelings. And it gets more and more complicated. And you know, because you, you teach young learners, I assume so, you know that sometimes the words are quite specific. And we need to make sure that our children and our young learners understand the difference between sad and upset. There's not much of a difference, right? But um, so, so, so why not showing them that they can check the, uh, the understanding on their own? Because we want them to be independent and we want to make it easier for them as they grow up, right? So uh, at some point, you know, we let our students go right, third grade, and sometimes they have a different teacher, and then they grow up, they, they graduate, and they go to the university, and so on, and they will be exposed to many words, such as disinterested and uninterested, very similar words, but there is a difference between them. And if we put uh, some effort into teaching them some learning strategies and some, to develop some cognitive skills, they would know how to deal with it, even if we are not there anymore. They would know how to deal with these terrible words such as anti-disestablishmentarianism. It took me two weeks to learn it. It's the longest word that I know in English. So, but it exists, right? So, uh, of course, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but at some point they will uh, have to face some longer, more complex words, you know, five syllables, and you, you kind of like, you know, it's tongue twisters. They will figure out the way how to deal with it because you have already supplied them with a lot of methods and you have developed some skills in them and they have a choice, and they can say, well, drilling doesn't work for me, but this does, I don't know, making a picture, or spelling, spelling helps. And uh, they would know how to deal with words of uh, foreign origins, so croissant or croissant in English, right? And as you know, every year there are so many words, new words in dictionaries. Do you know what Froyo is? 2017, huh? Yeah, it's frozen yogurt. How did you know? Uh, I know, I used to work there. Like <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about a listicle? Um, it's some kind of an article, but what type of an article? Something that, if, if you open any website, you will see many listicles. That's how we read nowadays. 10 best places to visit in Warsaw. One, two, three, four, it's a list, right? A listicle, now it makes sense, doesn't it? Right, uh, but it's a new word, and I, I, I just found this word for the purpose of this presentation, to be honest, so uh, I didn't know it, but now I know. Um, and I applied some skills to learn it, right? So um, we're talking about grades one, three. So at some point, grade three, when we let our students go, before we continue, we want to make sure that they know what to, like how to apply their skills, that they know how to learn. Uh, and they, it's not like they only know the language, they know how to learn the language. This is something that I wish uh, my teachers back then 20 years ago had put more effort on. Uh, but fortunately, we have many passionate teachers now, because otherwise no one would be here on Saturday, right? It's Saturday. Uh, but we are all here, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we can um, talk about it. <coughs> now, uh, vocabulary and learning words is one thing. Now there's the next step, finding key, specific, but also general information. You know, like reading for detail, reading for gist. Uh, this is something that is really uh, important because this is what we are being tested on later on, don't you think? And also at work, like we are all teachers, so it's slightly different, but I assume that not all of our students will become teachers and they will have various jobs and they will also have to 
quickly find information, right? They will not have time to spend hours on, you know, reading an article. Sometimes they just have five minutes. We all work under the pressure of time. So um, let's say I have this text in a book in my classroom and I want to work on it. Now, there are four, here you can see two puppets, but there are actually four puppets described. And then the task is to, to um, choose three puppets, describe them with a key word, and then the other person has to guess which puppet it is. Uh, now, as a teacher, I open the book, I see this, and my idea um, is to deal with it in a slightly different way. I think this is a good beginning, but I'd like to add a twist to my lessons. So what I would do is actually, I would ask my students to look at the pictures only, the photos I mean, okay? So not, not these, but just the photos, and make lists of keywords, okay? So words that describe these pictures, just simple, or single words. So for example, with, what, what could you say here? Mm -hmm. Anything else? I don't know if you can see it clearly, but they're standing in, the, in uh, like a pond. It's water. Right, it's a bit too bright, maybe. Uh, any colors, maybe? Yeah? Exactly. And how about this puppet? Uh-huh. What color? Uh-huh, green and white even, right? And anything else? Strings, right? You probably, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's a string doll. Right, so you move the strings and it dances or does whatever you want. So they just get the photos and they have to discover what's important about these dolls. And then they get the text and they have to find the words they have written before and uh, cross them out so they don't see them anymore, right? So they check how many of these words are actually keywords of the text. So we get rid of these words they have mentioned, and then they get texts in the next lesson, so they don't, because I want them to kind of forget. Um, they get these texts, and um, they have to check if without these words, they can still match a fragment of a text with a photo, all right? If they did a good job, then probably it will be a bit difficult, don't you think, because you have no keywords. And that's how uh, I, I teach them, this is grade one, that's how I teach them what keywords are and why they are so important. Without them, you don't understand the text. And then they start thinking about the text in a slightly different way. Why right? they're thinking about main or specific information that they, they can find in a text. And then, wait, oh, sorry, then we can do the activity. Right? Because they already have uh, some examples of keywords that they have found on their own. So it's like a long process to lessons, but it's worth it. Because then, as they grow up, they have longer texts and they have to find even more specific information. This is grade three. And um, they already, they're familiar with the idea, the concept of keywords. So what I do here is slightly different. Uh, I want to make it difficult for them. Uh, and I want them to, to, to work with the text because I believe it's really important. So what I do is I just give them the text. I give them a set of post-its and they have to find the keywords and write them down. One keyword on one post-it. They don't see this yet. Okay, it's covered. And um, they only have, for the whole text, the same amount of post-its as the gaps here. So we make sure that they don't, you know, go crazy and just copy everything because this is not the point. And then <clears throat> what I do is I ask them to collect their post-its. Uh, they may do it in groups, they may do it individually, it depends on your students, but you know them best, right? And then they have to fill these gaps, but they, only, they don't have a text anymore. They only have these keywords. And if they can fill all the gaps, it means that they really did a good job. If they can uh, fill most of the gaps, it's still okay. But if they can't fill any, then something went wrong and we have to work on that. Now, look how, how much thinking takes place here. And I love it, I love it when my students are like, oh, this is difficult. Yes, because easy is boring and difficult is where you learn, right? So, um, 
So this is exactly what they will be doing. They don't know yet. They're you know, only eight years old or nine years old. Uh, but we know, as teachers, that soon they will have to seat their exams. And this is what they have to do. Now, is there anyone here who prepares kids for YL exams? Or so you know, right? This is exactly what they have to do. And then they grow up and there's, you know, FC, CA and so on. It's always about this. Always. Not only in English lessons, by the way. We're actually helping other teachers, don't you think? Because this is what happens in Polish too. I mean, the, the literature, uh, literature lessons, right? So, uh, not only we're great, but also very kind, aren't we? So, uh, yeah, so this is something I would really pay attention to, and this is something I would really, really work on. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So, now, <coughs> we're done with learning new vocabulary. We have some strategies, we develop them as years goes by, go by. Um, our students gradually learn how to find specific information, at first with a lot of support from us teachers, because it's difficult. It's difficult even for us adults, I think. And uh, then they're becoming more and more independent, and uh, they work individually. They know how to work it out on their own. So now it's time for visual content. <coughs> and as you know, because we all use social media, don't we? Now, you know, the, the phenomenon of, of, of uh, Instagram, or do you use Instagram? It's all visual, isn't it? And all the Pinterest and all the other things that we use, we read less, we watch more. And it might be okay, it might be not, but we have to accept that this is the world we live in and we, have, we don't have much of a choice. I personally love reading, but um, I'm okay with, with pictures, with infographics. Do you use infographics? It's actually, you know, simple icons and pictures that give well, that, that contains some information, right? So, sooner or later, our students will be exposed to graphs, to diagrams, and they have to know how to, how to read them. Now, we look at it, and to us, it's like, yeah, it's easy. Come on, you have numbers and, and words, and you just connect them together, uh, because we're adult, and we know, right? But I imagine that my students who are six or seven, they go like, well, I don't really get these colors, and what, do I, what am I doing it for? So, uh, I think it's very important to start working with such things from the very beginning. But I also think, and I believe it's very important, to make it um, as personal as it can be. Because I want my students to understand that what's shown in this picture represents the real life. And now, as you sit, I'd like you to turn to a person sitting next to you and think of how to do it. And in a moment, I'll show you my ideas. How to make it personal, how to make your students understand that they might be a part of this diagram, or the world around them is a part of this diagram. Okay, so just turn to a person next to you. You can make some new friends too. Okay, and, and think of how to do it. And maybe you have your methods, then share them. Right? Is there anyone who would like to share their idea? Find someone who, find someone who okay. Uh, so find someone who can ride a bike, for example. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you take these examples and you use them in a the classroom. And they know that riding a bike is not only something that is written in a book, but it's something that I do too, right? And maybe some other people in my class. Any other ideas maybe? Oh, you've been talking. I heard you talking. Don't be shy. Anyone? All right. Um, let me show you my idea to deal with it. Uh, I used to do a lot of crafts. I used to do crocheting. 
Unfortunately, to make a whole blanket, you have to be very patient. So I ended up with having a lot of patches, never put them together. Uh, <laughs> I will maybe at some point. <clears throat> so what I do is um, I distribute them among my students. So each child gets one, okay? So this particular patch, there are various colors. This patch represents me. And I put flashcards on the floor. Now here we have some activities like watching TV and riding, uh, skateboarding and uh, riding a bike. But of course you can use it with colors, you can use it with whatever you want and whatever you're discussing. And so we have these flashcards and as you can see there's also this empty space here which is also important. And each student has to choose his or her favorite activity and we put our patches above it, okay? So in my class, two of the students like watching TV, but look, most of them like skateboarding, which comes as a surprise because I never thought that skateboarding is that popular anymore. But apparently it is. And uh, well, definitely more people like skateboarding than riding a bike, which again was surprising to me. So look how much language we have here, okay? so. Uh, my favorite activity is, or more people like this than other people, okay? So we're still teaching the language because this is what we do. Uh, but apart from that, my students can see that this, and this is exactly the same thing, right? Except here, they are a part of it, so they're excited. Now, what happens with the blank space? Here, I have all the students who like different activities. They're not very into watching TV, riding a bike or skateboarding. There's something else that they like more. Now, what things can they like more? Just give me some examples. Okay, well, yeah, playing computer games, anything else? Yes. Okay. So we already have at least five examples. Now imagine a class of 20 students, right? Here we had um, we have five examples, right? Uh, this is the moment when uh, you get more language from them. Not only what you teach, but also what they know how to say. It doesn't have to be a topic of your lesson. They can say something you haven't even taught them, but they might know it. Look, there's, like, you get so much language from them. They do the job. You're just listening, right? and then you can note it down, correct, and uh, talk about it. But most of the time, as far as my experience goes, uh, students are very excited about this part because, you know, I'm special, right? I don't care about skateboarding, right? It's, it's too, you know, everyone likes it. I'm unique and we like to be unique and kids like to be unique and they like to be uh, talked about, right? So that's, that's one thing I do. And you see exactly the same thing. Right? So then when they open the book, they see, they know what to do with it. Because they've done it before. Well, it's obvious, right? These are some kids, just like me and you. And let me show you one more example. Uh, one of my favorite, when it comes to visual content. By accident, I have these two bottles with me. But now I need you to take a... Wait! So now I have one. Uh, I need you to take a piece of paper. You all have these, right? Now, don't use the whole... Uh, don't use the whole piece of paper, you can share it with a person, okay? One third should be enough, okay? Like that. That should be it. And... Wreck it. This is a nice feeling, isn't it, right? So make a small ball, something like that, okay? All right. Do you have it? Not too big, okay? Can't be too big, it should be more or less this size. Right, the size of your thumbnail in 3D. I don't know, I don't have any other comparison. <laughs> nothing, nothing better comes to my mind. All right, do you have it? Okay, so now, uh, okay, here comes the difficult part. Too many things in my hands. Okay, so we have two bottles. One represents color red and one color purple. Now in a moment, I will walk here and I would like you to put your piece of paper into this bottle that represents the color that you like more. So if, if you prefer red, you put it here, right? If you prefer purple, you put it here. Okay, good. So let me, let me do it now. 
All right, would you? Okay, I'm sorry, my, f I, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Wait. Okay, I think this is the best way. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you? Okay, I think I will not have a chance to get all the pieces of paper. Oh, you can try to throw them. Give it a try. <laughs> if I catch it, I want a pack of cookies. All right. I see. Throwing at your teacher, right? <laughs> hey, throw a piece of paper at your teacher and see what happens. <laughs> right? This is the only chance you get. Okay, um, maybe here. We need some more. Okay. And here. Good, thank you. Well, I'll run here. Okay. We teachers are used to running, aren't we? Definitely. Anyone else? Would you like to contribute? Thank you. All right, good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, it's a bit easier in a classroom, right? Uh, if there is no throwing at a teacher. Okay. So now we have two bottles. Now tell me, which color is more popular in this room? Red. Okay, so apparently we prefer red. Interesting, because most of the time it's purple. Um, okay, so what's the difference between this and this? This is cooler, right? <laughs> okay, but there's more running. Um, it's the same. Again, visual content, personalized. You take part, you contribute. And then, do I know how many people like red color? Is there any way to check it? How? Just, <laughs> well, I still don't know, right? But I will have to count it, right? Um, so, you see, again, we teach our students that diagrams are numbers, but diagrams are also real life. Right? And they get very excited about it. Once I did it with, uh, that was a mistake actually, but if you have small classes, it might work. Uh, every student had a cup of water and we were pouring water. So you know, you, you can imagine right, what happened. I was all wet, and, uh, but it was the summer. If you do it, <laughs> do it in the summer, right? <clears throat> and of course you can add, you can use whatever you want. You can, each of your students can have, uh, I don't know, a little piece of, I don't know, a magnet or a little ball with his, the first letter of his name written down and so on. So the sky's the limit, right? <clears throat> okay, because then when they grow up, and again, we are working with very young students, but eventually they will grow up. Unfortunately, we all do, right? And they will be exposed to this and they will know what to do, right? It will come as no surprise. It's, you know, you're 20 something, you look at it, it's like, ah, oh, it's just like primary school, you know, throwing at a teacher, right? So they would, they would know how to deal with it. And thanks to your effort, right? Thanks to the job that, that you and me, that we all do. Because as I said, we're all passionate, obviously. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. All right, <coughs> so let's have a look at the last part, which I think is the most important part ever. This is why I learned Armenian, because I wanted to express my opinion. Now. These three things we have just discussed, these are the ways to, to understand, to learn. This is the very purpose of learning, isn't it? Right? Uh, because in real life, well, you don't think about verbs and nouns. You think about what you want to say. And I think that the most important thing is to teach our students, starting from a very young age, to, to say what they think, not only to say what they can say, what they are capable of saying in terms of language. And... Uh, I think our job here is very difficult, is very challenging, because we have to teach them how to express their opinion in a foreign language. Which basically means that we should be paid double, don't you think? Because we do two things at the same time. So, I don't know, Monday you can try to talk to your boss. Um, or the principal. Anyway, so this is, this is absolutely like, this is something uh, that I teach for. This is something that I believe makes me a good teacher and I believe makes you good teachers and makes our job very meaningful. So, uh, another quick personal anecdote about this, you know, traumatic. 
Uh, when I was 19, I went to the university and I was studying philosophy in English. At the age of 19, I was like, whoa, going to be smart, finally, right? Um, so I remember uh, our lecturer said like, okay, so read this, read that, read about Plato, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, I spent three days at the age of 19 when everyone went to party. I spent three days learning about Plato, Socrates, and all these philosophers. And then came the lecture, and I sat there, and there was a question. So what, my, my lecturer asked me, what do you think about the meaning of life, or something like that, you know, something important. And I was very proud, I stood up, I said, well, Plato said this, and Socrates says this. And my teacher was like listening, listening, and then I said, okay, I know, but what do you think? And then, at the age of 19, I learned the hard way that I, have no, I don't have my own opinion. I never thought I could have my own opinion. I always thought that, well, Plato, how can I dislike Plato? I mean, it's Plato, right? There are some limits, right? There are some lines you can't cross. Um, you cannot dislike Shakespeare, because it's Shakespeare, right? People like him, so we also like him. And that's how I learned that actually, um, I should have my own opinion, and sometimes it will be quite controversial, and sometimes it will be different to other opinions, but it's okay. And this is what I started to teach my students from the very, very beginning. And of course, we do not talk about Plato, you know, first graders, not yet, um, but we talk about stories. So here's an example of a story. So uh, there's a comic, there's a, long story short, there's a monkey, and the monkey meets elephants, they're crossing the river but the monkey can't cross the river, so she jumps on the back of an elephant and says, hey elephant, can, I, can you give me a ride? And the elephant is a very nice elephant, so says, yes, okay, come on. And the monkey is very hungry, <coughs> and the monkey realizes that the elephants have bags. In these bags, they have mangoes. And monkeys love mangoes, everyone loves mangoes. So, uh, it's a very clever monkey. So, she asks a little elephant, like, hey, can you pass me these three stones from the bottom of a river, because I want to play with them. And the little elephant, which you can see in the picture, says, yeah, all right. So what she does, what the monkey does, is she exchanges, she swaps mangoes for stones. And as they cross the river, she takes all the mangoes and runs away. Now the elephants realize that there's something wrong. They're also hungry, you know, and uh, it's, it's lunchtime. So uh, they realize that the monkey cheated on them and they start to chase the monkey. Now the monkey runs away and she, and she sees all the animals and starts to shout that the elephants are super uber angry and we have to run away. So all the animals run away and there's a lot of dust. The animals run, they hide on top of a mango tree. And you can imagine 30 animals on top of a mango tree. You know, it starts shaking and all the mangoes fall down. And the elephants find them, and they're happy because they had three mangoes, now they have 30 mangoes, and the monkey is left with nothing. Which is a nice story, isn't it? Uh, oh, that's a good point, not for a monkey, or maybe. I don't know yet, because we might have a different opinion. So, um, look at this book activity. We, tell about, we talk about the story, we talk about feelings, we learn some vocabulary, and finally we get to the point when there's a question. Do you think monkey is good or bad? Now, do you think monkey is, who thinks monkey is good? Raise your hand. All right, who thinks monkey is bad? All right, I can see some people who are not sure about it. All right, uh, so this is what I do in my classroom. We talk about it, is monkey good, is monkey bad? Well, most of the time they'll say monkey is bad, uh, unless you have this joker in your class who'd always say something else, which is also good. Um, but I don't finish here, because we talk about what's good, what's bad, and why. And we talk about giving opinions, personal opinions. So, uh, because this is the skill we want to develop, give our students enough courage to express themselves. So we make a class contract. Now, these are not my ideas. These are the ideas that my students come up with, right? So they say that we shouldn't be unkind, but they don't only say it, they also say why. Because if you're unkind, then other people are sad. Of course, they use poor grammar for that, because again, first or second grade, but it doesn't matter, because we, like here, I want to teach them, I want to develop the skill to express their opinions. The language, they need more language, that will come later, we need some time for that, okay? But we do it simultaneously, okay? We teach the language, we develop these cognitive 
skills. <coughs> so, uh, so we have a very nice contract. And then I remember hearing it's like something did, someone did something wrong and it was like, don't be a monkey. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so fair enough. Now, um, this is a task from the third grade, or the second, I think third. Um, so the story is different, but for the purpose of this presentation, let's take the same story. Okay, so do you remember the ending of the story? How did it finish? Uh huh. So elephants, elephants were happy, monkey was sad, but still, at the end, all the animals were on top of the tree, and the elephants were, you know, next to the tree. They were happy. The animals were scared or sad. And here, um, there are two alternative endings to this story. As the task suggests, right? Choose the ending that you like more, and why. So it's more difficult than to say I like it, I don't. So uh, I would like you to read both of them. Right. Sorry for a typo with the word mangoes. That's my fault. Right. And now, who likes this ending more? Raise your hand. Uh, not not all of the people. Okay. How about this ending? Who likes it more? Okay. Now, what if I told you that I like this ending more? Do you think I'm a bad person? Don't be judgmental. <laughs> okay, uh, I like this ending more because I think it's a surprise. Because from each story, I would expect happy endings, something you know, good, positive values. This is something I wouldn't expect. And I'm not saying that this story is nicer with this ending, but I like it more, and this is my opinion. How about that? It's okay, isn't it? Right? We don't have to like the same things. My kids. You know, there's always a kid in every class who's a bit of a rebel, right? Who would say, well, this is boring, this is not. Well, it's okay. This is boring. Fair enough. You can think it's boring. You can think that Shakespeare is overrated. That's fine. Just say why. Okay? And just, just be ready to say why. <coughs> be ready to give your own opinion. And um, there's a last task for you. Uh, I would like you to, like, as you sit again, uh, tell a person next to you yet another alternative ending to this story. Okay? Just one minute. So here we had two. Think of another one. You can go crazy. Nice. <laughs> right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to discuss it for as much time as I would like to. Um, my students would do the same. And you teach young learners. You know they like to go crazy, right? Sometimes they don't have enough language for that which kind of slows them down a bit, which is sometimes maybe good. Um, but they have, we have a lot of alternative endings. Sometimes we'll create them in groups. It depends, again, whether your students are shy or more, you know, um, courageous. Well, it, it depends. You know your students best. And then what we do is what I call positive peer feedback, which is what I learned when I was t taking CELTA course um, and learning to be a teacher. Uh, they have to find one thing that they like about their friend's ending and say why they like it. So, on one hand, they express their opinion, but they learn to do it in a very positive and very kind way. I might not like your ending too much, but I do like this part about it. Beats, I like the fact that your elephants are blue, doesn't matter. Okay, we find positive things. We, learn, we teach our kids to express opinions in a very kind and very positive ways so they can benefit from it when they grow up. And I think, you know, that in general we have a problem with that, right? We like to criticize, and we, but we don't like to be criticized. We have to learn to give feedback in a positive way, to express our opinion in a way that does not hurt anyone. 
So, uh, speaking about expressing opinions, there's this last example I'd like to show you. I would like all my students to be like this girl. Now, do you know this girl? Oh, okay. Huh. Just for a moment. Do you know her? All right. She, is there anyone who doesn't know this girl? Okay, she was a girl who, at the age of eight, was brave enough to express her opinion in Tesco, which, where she went with her mother to do the shopping. She wanted to buy some clothes. And uh, the film with her went viral on YouTube <clears throat> because she got very angry, because she realized that most of the clothes for girls say, hey, beautiful, or sweet butterflies, or be a princess. I don't know if you can, you see? And I feel uh, I am charming or something like that. But the, the clothes for boys would say, welcome adventure, or uh, be a hero, think outside the box. And she was <laughs> like, she's standing for three minutes saying like, I don't like it, because this and because that. And this is exactly what I want my students to be. I want them to, use the language that I teach them to express their opinion confidently and to say what they really think. And even if they think that these, this is actually okay, that's fine. But I want them to know that they can disagree and then can ha they can have their own opinion. And uh, so eventually, as, you know, as we teach, we start from grade one, we uh, go until grade three because this is our interest today. Um, we give our students more and more tools to learn and more and more courage to express themselves. So we end up with a student who has a lot of things to choose from, a lot of strategies to choose from. Um, a lot of ways, he or she knows many ways in which they can learn something. Not only the language, but also, um, to, I mean, not only use the language, but also know how to learn it because they will keep learning it. We don't stop, right? We are still learning, I guess. Everyone is. So we have a student which is brave and conscious, and it's all controlled. We don't go crazy. We don't take our six-year-olds go like, okay, you will do this, that. It takes some time. You start with first graders, you add some more when it comes to the second grade, and then with the third grade, you still develop these skills, and you add some more slowly, all right? Because we're not in a hurry. And uh, eventually we get students who, instead of having this bus that goes no one knows where, and just to mind you, the, uh, in Armenia, the, the fact that all the buses are number 32 doesn't necessarily mean they go the same direction. You really have to understand what's written. Um, so instead of this, we give our students that. A very nice double-decker, very cozy, comfortable. We know where it goes, and uh, they feel safe and they're ready to explore further. So thank you very much for this meeting and Shnora uh, Kalutsin, which is Armenian. Thank you very much.